Greetings and welcome to 303. We are in Senior English A in our uh, ongoing work now with Chaucer and his Canterbury Tales. Now let's just review where we've been. Maybe it makes sense for you to list some of this at level one just to make sure that we all understand. First, we took a look at who Chaucer was. We talked about him and his biography. We placed him in that time Right, uh, Roughly think of it as 1350 to 1400 is the year that we think that he dies. Okay? Then we took a look at Chaucer's Canterbury Tales general prologue, where Chaucer basically introduces us to an entourage, a group of travelers, fictitious, he made it up, from London to Canterbury. And the rules of the game, what is the game? We're going to travel along the road, we're going to stop, we're going to pull over the entourage to the side of the road, we're going to break out a few brewskis, we're going to have a little drinking, then we're going to have one individual who will step up and will introduce himself or herself. Hi, I am the partner, let me introduce myself. And then we're going to get to the tale of the story. We've already taken a look at the introduction by the partner of himself in what's called the partner's prologue. Now we turn to the actual story itself, but before we go there, we want to make a quick observation at 2B. Remember, you've already got your annotations in front of you flowed in terms of 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. And we will now make a rhetorical or a literary analysis observation at 2B, and that is this. We said it already, but let's review. There is always going to be a relationship, a contiguity, between the specific prologue of the storyteller and the tale that that storyteller will divulge. Now, of course, all of this is the genius of Chaucer. He makes all of it up. But remember, Chaucer wants you to imagine that he's traveling with the entourage. He's sitting there as the partner stands up and says, Hi, I'm the partner. Let me tell you about how I like to preach. And Chaucer is supposed to be like, the first CNN embedded journalist, just writing the information down. Of course, he makes it all up. But there is this dramatic quality to the stories because of the narrative approach of Chaucer. And I would write it down at 2B as that. The narrative approach. In other words, the way Chaucer tells the story, right? We now are going to turn to the actual partner's tale, and I'm with you on page 123 and the preparing to read. Now, why am I dealing with this page now and not before the partner's prologue? Here's why. Your textbook company is focusing on the tale itself. It's a very famous story. Let's go ahead and say it in our notes. Chaucer did not actually invent this story. It was a story that was known even before Chaucer's day. Chaucer, however, puts a few wrinkles in the story, all right? But at the end of the story, we're going to ask this simple question, and so let's write it down at level 2B. What is the relationship between the partner's prologue and the partner's tale or story, okay? And so our goal is to know enough about the prologue of the partner so that we can, at the end of the tale, go, I see some relationships between the two. Let's now turn to page 123, and let's begin with the connecting to the essential question that's provided for us here. In this tale, I'm reading, I hope you're reading with me on page 123. In this tale told by Chaucer's partner, greed is an important motivation. Consider what you've observed about the power of greed. As you read, look for examples of greed in this tale, and notice its effect on the characters and action. Now let's just review from the partner's prologue, that we have three words for the word greed. Let's write them down. The first one, obviously, was greed. We get our word greedy from this word, right? Desiring what you really don't need is maybe what we would call greed, okay? The other two words, avarice, avarice, and cupidity. Cupidity. They both mean the same thing, greedy. So to be avaricious simply means to be greedy. Do you got To be greedy. Okay? Now, the question again, that's the essential connecting question, is how does literature shape or reflect society? And we'll come back to this in our analysis of the partner's tale at the end of our discussion. Let's jump now to literary analysis. You're going to write this information down now, right now, at level 2B. 
Under literary analysis, the term is, see it in bold, I hope you're writing it down, allegories. What is an allegory? Narratives that have both literal and deeper symbolic meanings. Let's go ahead and say it now. An allegory is a story that has at least double meaning. A literal meaning, an implied meaning. A literal understanding, a metaphoric or a secondary understanding. Okay? Non-literal, you might say. Non-literal. Okay? So, for example, you can think about a favorite song that you have right now. About that favorite song you can point out. There's two ways to listen or read that song. One is at the literal level, what the words literally say. The second is at the metaphoric or the implied meaning, what the words kind of can imply to me. Okay? The partner's tale, I'm back now reading with you. The partner's tale is a kind of allegory called an exemplum, Latin for example. The tale is an exemplum against the sin of greed, and the partner uses the tale to illustrate the point of one of his sermons. Love of money is the root of all evil. So let's just write this down. In the partner's prologue, he already has told us that his favorite biblical text is, verse, the love of money is the root of all evil. Then he says he turns around and he tells this story, we will call it the partner's tale, right, about greed. So we can go ahead right now and write down. Watch how this works. It's very fascinating. We can right now write down it. 2A, themes, messages. We can write down right now that one of the major messages or themes of the partner's tale is greed is bad. Greed is bad. We're, we're going to see this played out. Now, it's going to be interesting. Allegorically, we're going to see how that game gets played out. To teach its lesson effectively, I'm back reading. An allegory must be easily understood and remembered by the listeners. For this reason, an allegory may use certain basic storytelling patterns or, I hope you're writing this one down because it's in bold, archetypal narrative elements. Archetypal narrative elements found in folk literature around the world. Okay? Archetypal. Now that word archetype or archetypal, for those of you, for example, who are familiar with Carl Jung, the great psychologist who studied first under Sigmund Freud, he talked about some of the great archetypes. For example, if you see in a drawing or in a music video a character dressed all in black with a large hood and a thing held in his hand called a scythe, what you cut if you're an old-fashioned Reaper, Reaper of corn. The, we know this character as the what? Grim Reaper, dressed all in black, or understood archetypally as simply representing death. Yes? Okay. That, that's, that kind of personality, person, character, is then going to represent or be an archetype of death. We're actually going to see that very archetype in this story. Okay? Now, these elements of archetypal narrative literature, we, we've got four bullet pointed. I hope you've written them down in your own words. Characters, events, other things that come in threes. Let's point that out. So if you see, for example, the number three at all in the story, we're going to pay attention to it. You're going to write it down. A test of the character's morality, what's right, what's wrong. A mysterious guide who helps point the way and a just ending that rewards good or punishes evil, what we will call for your notes, retributive justice. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And we're going to see this play out. Because it, is a because it is structured to contain such elements, the basic story in this tale survived retellings as it traveled from ancient India to Europe. As you read, note the archetypal elements that make the allegory and its moral clear and memorable. So as we read the story, we're going to be paying attention to these archetypal types of elements. One easy way to point this out is at 3A. All of the different moments in this story that remind you of movies, of TV shows, of video games, and certainly of music that you're familiar with. Okay. The reading strategy suggested, if you cannot fully understand a passage at first, reread it and the surrounding passages. Rereading can help you clarify characters' identities, the sequence or causes of events, and puzzling language. OK? 
okay? And they, they'll even make a suggestion here on the right-hand side with these boxes, okay? Please notice the six vocabulary words. I hope that you've got those written down. And as we meet those words then in the story itself, starting on page 127, I hope then that that will help you as well as you prepare for the examination. Now, our treatment of the partner's prologue was in large measure a philosophic treatment. We were asking, how does Chaucer play very interesting games as satirist? That satirical writing, that ironic approach to his agenda. Again, we defined him as an iconoclastic writer. That is to say, attacking sacred traditions. Now we're going to turn to the story itself. Here, we will literally treat the story as a work of literature where we will analyze and annotate on our three levels, beginning at level one. We'll read for a little bit, then we'll pause. I will ask you to put the events of the story in your own words. In other words, literally, what is happening? We're going to find that this is a very simple story. Back from our freshman year of high school, you'll maybe recall that they taught you about the key elements of plot. Do you remember this? Where you have some kind of introduction to the story, what they call exposition. You have rising action. Some of you are nodding your eye. I remember this. Rising action, some kind of climax, and some kind of denouement or falling action or resolution. Yes? We're going to see this played out in our little story. Okay? And to that degree, at at 2B, let's point out two things about this story before we begin. There is going to be the actual story that the partner tells about three bros and their quest for death, okay? And then there's going to be the end of Chaucer telling us what happens after the story has been told. The partner has been drinking. Remember this from the partner's prologue. The partner has been drinking. He's got a little bit of a buzz. He's a little bit drunk. And he's let his tongue say some things that probably normally he would not say. We're all familiar with that concept. The Sumner, as we said, by the end of the partner's prologue, is probably doing one of these numbers. Like, dude, would you just shut up? You're, you're giving away too much. The partner is now going to turn. Remember he said, though I am a wholly vicious man, don't think I can't tell moral tales I can. In other words, I'm a really bad guy, but I can tell a moral story that will make people want to behave in certain morally appropriate ways. We're now going to read the story. And about the story, we're simply going to ask plotline information at level one. What happens first? What happens next? What happens in the end? Okay? But then afterwards, the partner's drunken buzz will have worn off. And all of a sudden, he's going to be ready to make some observations about this story. He's going to start preaching. Ironically, it's as if he's totally forgotten that he's already told us that every time he preaches, it's like a total game and it's lying mockeries. And by the end of the story, we're going to see some real irony again. And of course, Chaucer will be entertaining us as we go. Let's go to page 127. The story itself now, let's just read it. We'll pause momentarily at level one. We'll have you write down what's actually happening. The partner's tale. It's of three rioters, I have to tell. By the way, let's just pause the word rioter here. We sometimes think of riot as in to cause a major disruption or disturbance. All Chaucer's audience would have understood here rioters to mean is three drunk idiots. I would write it down that way. Three drunk idiots, okay? Three fools, we might say. Rioters here can also mean fools. Uh-oh, but notice right away the archetypal elements. Did you see this? There's the word three right in the very first line of the story, right? So we're going to see the first of the threes, all right? It's of three rioters, I have to tell, who long before the morning service bell were sitting in a tavern for a drink. In other words, that long before 9 o'clock in the morning. So they're already in the bar drinking at 9 in the morning, which tells you they obviously do this crazy party thing a lot. And as they sat, they heard the handbell clink before a coffin going to the grave. Now, this tells us something about Chaucer's day, so let's put it in our notes. kind of fascinating. When you die, you don't die in a hospital. Rather, you die at home, often in the very bed that you were born in. Okay? And then what happens after you die? They have a little wake where uh, some of your friends come and look at you, right? Then somebody comes, pulls up at the front of your house. They carry your body out. They put it in a cart. And then the cart goes out to bury you somewhere outside of town. The individual leading that cart will ring a bell. 
Now, by the time we, we meet John Donne's Meditation 17, don't ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. We're going to know all about that idea that this ringing of the bell tells you somebody has died. And so the rioters are now going to turn and ask about this ringing of the bell. I'm with you on page 127, line 87, 86. One of the rioters called the little tavern knave and said, Go and find out at once. Look, Spry, whose corpse is in that coffin passing by? And see you get the name correctly, too. Line 90. Sir, said the boy, no need. I promise you, two hours before you came here, I was told, he was a friend of yours in days of old, and suddenly, last night, the man was slain upon his bench, face up, dead, drunk again. Top of page 128. There came a privy thief, they call him Death, who kills us all around here, and in a breath, he speared him through the heart, he never stirred. And then death went his way without a word. He's killed a thousand in the present plague. And sir, it doesn't do to be too vague. If you should meet him, you had best be wary. Be on your guard with such an adversary. Be primed to meet him everywhere you go. That's what my mother said. It's all I know. So the three drunks. Drunk already in the morning before nine o'clock. Hear the bell ringing, somebody's dead. They ask the young boy who works at the bar, hey, what's going on? Find out who's in the coffin. He goes, hey, I can already tell you that. Two things. Let's write it in our notes. Two things. One, uh, the guy who's dead, he was a pal of yours. Interestingly, uh, he's kind of like you. He spent all of his time being drunk. And what do you know? When he was dead, he was actually drunk. It's number two thing. The one who did it is named Death. He's been around a lot lately, the little boy says. In fact, a thousand dead from the current plague. Current plague, right? Lots of people dying of this death. We're now back to page uh, 128, line 105. The publican joined in with, in your footnote here, the innkeeper, the guy who takes care of this inn, joined in with, quote, By St. Mary, what the child says is right. You'd best be wary. This very year he killed death, death. He killed in a large village a mile away, man, woman, serf, and tillage, page in the household children, all there were. Yes, I imagine that he lives round there. It's well to be prepared in these alarms. He might do you dishonor. In other words, better be careful. Death might be waiting for you as well, you three drunk idiots. One of them. Ha, huh. God's arms, the rioter said. Is he so fierce to meet? I'll search for him by Jesus, street by street, God's blessed bones. I'll register a vow. Here, chaps, lines 116. Here, chaps, the three of us together now. Hold up your hands like me, and we'll be brothers in this affair, and each defend the others. And we will kill this traitor death, I say. Away with him, as he has made away with all our friends. God's dignity tonight. Now, some of you are already smiling. I can see why. Let's write it down. What is the irony? The irony is three drunk idiots make a vow that they are going to go kill death. Okay. By the way, if you haven't seen it, the great Belushi, who is a, one of the finest comics for Saturday Night Live, if you haven't Googled this, go, or YouTube this, YouTube this, he has a telethon on one of his shows for Saturday Night Live, a skit, Help Stop Death in Our Lifetime. Okay? It is, of course, the penultimate irony, right? Why? Because as we learned when we studied Beowulf Part 3, we can write that down right now, can't we, at, 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 level, uh, two, at level 3A. I'm making a relation to another text. In Beowulf Part 3, remember that the dragon represents what? The penultimate evil. The evil you can never get away from, namely, of course, death. So we've got three idiot drunks who say they are going to go out and find death. That's the first part of our story in plot structure. That's what we call the exposition, the introduction. We know something about the three idiots. We know something about the storyline. And now they're all going to jump up, run out of the bar, and go look for death. Ha, ha, ha. What fools, what idiots. Now we'll continue with line 122 and following on page 128. The idiots, they made their bargain, swore with appetite, these three to live and die for one another as brother born might swear to his born brother. And up they started in their drunken rage and made towards this village 
which the page and publican had spoken of before. Many and grisly were the oaths they swore, tearing Christ's blessed body to a shred. If we can only catch him, death is dead. And again, ha, 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 you can kind of see the irony here. Dude, let's go kill death. Let's do it, shall we? You know, the drunk idiots. When they had gone, not fully half a mile, just as they were about to cross a stile, they came upon a very poor old man who humbly greeted them and thus began. Last line on page 128. God look to you, my lords, and give you quiet. Top of page 129. To which the proudest of these men of riot gave back the answer, What old fool? Get place. In other words, shut up. Why are you all wrapped up except your face? Why live so long? Isn't it time to die? Ooh, let's just point out the irony here. They've gone off to find death so they can kill him. And instead they find an old man sitting by the side of the road. You could immediately jot down, couldn't you, at 3A? Examples that are similar here, right, of this kind of unknown old man, usually dressed up, we're told everything except for his face is covered, usually dressed in what? Black or gray, right, okay? And he's kind of like the old wise man, right? And they say to him, what's up with you? You're such an old fart. This is, of course, not paying proper respect to the geriatric or to the old. You ought to be dead by now. Why aren't you dead by now? They show him no respect. I'm on page 129. Now the response, page 140. The old, old fellow looked him in the eye and said, quote, because I never yet have found, though I've walked to India, searching round village and city on my pilgrimage, one who would change his youth to have my age. And so my age is mine and must be still upon me for such time as God may will. In other words, he says, you know, I'm a wonder. And everywhere I go as an old man, I walk up to a young person and I say, hey, will you change? Will you change with me? I will take your age and you can have my age. Are you ready to exchange? And he says, funny thing. Never have found a young kid that says, do it in a heartbeat. Now let's jump down at 2A. Why? Message theme here. Why? Why is it that young people do not want to exchange age with, a, with an 